My name is Francisco Martinez. I'm a civil engineer for Midas. Today we're doing one of a two-part series for mining and petroleum engineering. Today we'll focus on blast analysis using constitutive models for rock. And we'll have a small tunnel and we'll show some features in GTS that will allow us to get some results um, as far as the structure and the support structure and the tunnel itself. I'll do a, a very brief introduction over the company, and then we'll go cover some basic concepts for what is the constitutive models for rocks, as well as some of the dynamic load applications we'll be applying. And then lastly, we'll get right into how to model these kind of projects in 3D with a structure in place using Metas GTS and X. Just briefly to cover who we are, we're Midas. We're actually a, a global company. We are the number one worldwide for what is finite element solutions for civil engineering problems. Our headquarters is based out of South Korea, and we have branches, uh, branch offices all over the world, China, India, Japan, uh, Russia, the, I believe um, in Dubai, London, and we're transmitting live from New York. These are the line of softwares that we mainly handle, although we do have uh, all these other kind of softwares that are not necessarily applicable to civil engineering. But the main uh, softwares that we that we have are Midas Gen and Design Plus for uh, building analysis and design of structures, Midas Civil for bridges, and the focus of today for us is Midas GTS and X, which is 2D, 3D, same platform. However, we do have a, another geotech software called Soulworks that has some um, sort of static capabilities not available in GTSNX. GTSNX is purely finite elements. So there are some uh, features that are very handy for your day-to-day -day work that we won't cover today. We will cover Soulworks in the next session. But uh, it's more it could be considered a, an easier day-to-day -day software. It's 2D and sort of static analysis. And lastly, we have a mechanical engineering software, Minus NFX. If you're interested, um, depending on what part of the world you're from, you can visit our page to take a look at our other softwares, northamerica.midasuser.com, or if you want to see directly the page for like tutorials, demo version, and some uh, other features, you can go to midasgtsnx.com. Oh, let's get right into the concepts that we'll be covering today. Uh, we're going to be doing a dynamic analysis on rock. And the type of analysis we'll be doing will be a linear temp history analysis, although GTSNX is also capable of doing nonlinear temp history analysis. But basically, a temp history analysis is where you want to see a behavior, a dynamic behavior, displacement, stress, strains over time. Usually, there's a time dependent load. Um, depending whether you're selecting linear or nonlinear, this is uh, the material behavior you'll be able to account for. So there's two main features, as I was saying. You can do time history. You can do kind of like the seismic aspect of it, the normalized acceleration, or you can do a time-dependent either uh, force or pressure or moment in which you basically have a blast or a, a moving load like a train or some sort of cycl uh, cycle load, cyclic load like a pile being driven. So this is kind of like a graphic interpretation of what we were just talking about. Uh, for time history analyses, we can do like the seismic, where you can copy paste your own function, or you can use our database of earthquakes, or you can do some more of a time dependent load, like I'm saying, a vibration load of a, of a subway or train, and maybe check the effects on a nearby structure, or as we will do today, a blast. We will directly put a, a load in a nearby excavation, and we will see how it's affecting a, another structure nearby, assessing this effect of the load. So some things that we have to consider when we're doing the time history analyses, uh, these are some of the four main points. Uh, one of them is uh, when we tell the program uh, we need to define how long is the time history analysis itself is going to last. The blast itself might be a split second, uh, but it might take 20 seconds. It might take a, you know, a little bit longer, depending on how much we want to assess of the, of the vibration or the, the blast itself. Uh, over the over the whole model, and so 
that's what, how we define or how we decide. We need to you know, more or less have an idea of how long we want this analysis to be. Same with a seismic. Um, you want to have an, a, a long enough analysis time for your whole function to be uh, inputted into the model. The other is the time step. Time step is uh, the, the gap or the increment in time between each, each analysis um, the program is doing. So you can think of it as a, you know, when you create your function for your blast, there's an increment in time for every value you have of the force. So we want to match that time step when running the analysis to the time step of the force itself. Uh, other things we need to start to consider when we're doing a dynamic analysis are what are called the Rayleigh coefficients. You're basically your damping ratios. And basically, this is for dissipating energy at the boundaries. Uh, if we didn't have these in place, the program might end up, end up having some sort of a, uh, the blast bouncing off the, the boundary, uh, if it's a fixed boundary kind of thing. So to avoid that, uh, these kind of softwares allow us to have almost to simulate like an infinite boundary. Uh, you know, you can dissipate this energy. You allow it to to damp out. And lastly, we have dynamic loads. So basically, this is where you the graph we're seeing. This is a, a load that's going to vary over time. It's not a static load. It's not always on. It's going to decrease eventually, or maybe go back and forth. In this case, we'll be looking at this kind of function. It'll have a, a short peak within fractions of a second, and then what we'll really be looking at is the propagation of this blast over the model. A little bit more into the damping effects. Uh, GTSNX considers two types of damping, the mass proportional damping and the stiffness proportional damping. This is the equation that, that it uses. So when we're defining it um, in the analysis control, we'll see this window. And we have different methods for calculating it. In this case, we'll, we'll base it on the, the period of the two prevalent modes of our model. We'll get these periods from an eigenvalue analysis, a vibration mode analysis, we will run prior to running the time history analysis. And we're going to give it like a 5% damping ratio. Another feature uh, that the program has is that it allows us to generate the blast load function based on the formulas you select. So you can directly copy paste your own blast function from an Excel table. That's no problem. However, if you wanted to create one, um, Midas GTSNX does have a function based on different, uh, I guess, societies or institutes around the world that have following equations. And here are some of the parameters to define. So basically, you see this box open, and you input values like blast velocity, explosive density, charge diameter, information that explosive engineers uh, have, as well as the, the last, how long the blast lasts, and the time increment. So this time increment is what I was referring to, can kind of be seen in the graph is what we want to match when we're doing uh, defining the time history analysis. And lastly, today we'll be using a particular kind of what are known as constitutive models, which are numerical theories to capture the nonlinear behavior of the ground. In this case, uh, we'll be using Hope Brown, which is something uh, one of the later, latest constitutive models you can consider. Uh, from the 80s, there was, uh, you know, developed in order to better capture the behavior of rock. Uh, as we know, it's much stiffer and much strong, stronger than soil. So traditional constitutive models like more column don't apply as well to capture this behavior. So later, uh, there was another one developed called the Generalized Oak Brown, which is the one we'll be using today. Midas GTS has both. The main difference is that while the Hope Brown eventually uh, uses the same kind of parameters, the generalized Hope Brown allows you to basically define these by what would be like uh, rock mass classification schemes. So as you see here in the generalized Hope Brown, you have this extra table that allows you to, to get parameters uh, that are more well known, like the uh, geological strength index and the intact rock parameter. And it'll calculate for you based on these equations to get these other uh, uh, parameters that are necessary for simulating the rock. And this can also be used for the strength reduction method, which basically is a slope stability analysis. Here we're comparing uh, our model, our factor of safety, with a, I guess, a, a well-known rock science model. And we get very similar results. However, if we are going to use slope stability for the uh, using Hope Round, you should also activate this other box we see here, which is the residual parameters. So the first half, uh, these values, 
are for the intact rock, whereas when you activate residual parameters, it's supposed to model uh, after the rock has failed. So you really need to have this, especially for uh, slope stability analyses defined. And these are some of the charts that I'm sure everybody's aware who works with rocks. So that's the, the nice feature of the Hope Brown, that it's much easier to give it these range of values based on the kind of rock that you have and the program will calculate for you the, the strength of the rock itself. OK, so now we can jump right into the 3D model we're going to work on today. Uh, this is a, a quick screen, uh, screen capture of what we'll be seeing. We'll have a blast hole in a nearby excavation with a metallical structure in place and a small tunnel. And what we want to see is the, you know, the history of time analysis, the time history analysis of this wave propagating and how it's going to, you know, the forces it's going to create against the walls, the moments on the structure, displacements directly on the rock of the, of the wall of the tunnel itself. So we can, you know, depending on what you're doing, get a stability uh, idea of your structure, if it needs to be reinforced, that kind of thing. So it seems more like appropriate for like many mining projects where they have multiple excavation sites, uh, some sort of blast is going to affect the nearby structure. This is going to, the type of analysis, you get a better idea. And you could also run a, time his, uh, a slope stability coupled analysis at different points. You can request to get a stability of the slope. So you can you know, be blasting in the nearby areas, be sure of uh, your slope not failing. So these are steps we're going to follow. We'll do an import. We're going to work on a lot of uh, some of the features that we have to have the topography as well as the, the strata imported. Uh, we'll also have the materials defined for the whole ground. We'll generate the mesh, define some of the damping boundary conditions for the wave not to bounce. You can kind of see now here why this is important. If the wave was allowed to bounce, it would just go you know, forever if it was never damping out. And then we'll apply these uh, dynamic load conditions, basically the blast into the area, run the eigenvalue analysis that we need in order to define the modes, the periods for our time history analysis, and then we'll extract some results. This is a, a chart of the materials that we're working with. So we have uh, the concrete, which is basically shock creek that we'll be using for the, the tunnel, as well as the four rock layers. And we see here the parameters that we have. They get progressively stronger the deeper we go. And some of the Hope Brown, generalized Hope Brown parameters that we have to define are down here. And then the other thing that the program needs to know is how these materials are going to be used. So this is when we say we're defining a property. So we're going to tell it the concrete will actually be a 2D material. Uh, as we know as a shell, basically that can be considered like a wall, a reinforcement wall or a shock creek. And all the others will be basically used for 3D solids, which are the ground. So we can get right into it. The first thing we're going to do is when, uh, when you open the program, it allows you to define um, if you're going to be working on 3D, 2D, or axisymmetric, as well as the units. So we'll be working, we'll start off with kilojoules and meters, and then I'll show you how easy it is to switch back and forth between feet and kips and all that. And so another uh, a main difference, you could say, with uh, Flack or Plexi, some of the other known softwares, is that we have them all integrated in a single platform. When you get your TSNX, even if it's the basic version, you have all these uh, options for you. So you can work on something you know, day-to-day -day 2D or axisymmetric. When you have a real application or a real difficult application, you can work it on 3D. After we uh, start off a file, I'm going to be switching back and forth with uh, the PPT and uh, the program just to kind of show you the steps. So also, hopefully, I can kind of split the screen this way. Seems OK. So this is the interface of GTSNX. I recently just did the first step, which is when you start a new program, a new model. The program is going to have a pop-up window. This is what we just did, defining the units. We tell it it's 3D. And the interface we see is very friendly. It's based on icons, kind of like AutoCAD. So you have your tabs that are grouping all the commands that you need to know. Like the first tab is the most, uh, the, the first one being geometry. You can do your drawings, 3D, some features like bedding plane and a topography generator that we're going to use as well as some of the AutoCAD commands that we have, like extrude, divide, Boolean operations. Then you go onto your mesh, you define your materials, your properties, you generate your meshes, and you can even manipulate the meshes, like extruding them or sweeping them and such, or check the connection. 
And then you have, depending on the type of analysis you're running, specific geotech commands. For instance, if we're doing a slope stability analysis, uh, you can define, if it's a 2D model, you can define your arc surface failure. Or if you're doing a consolidation analysis, you can define, or a seepage analysis at your nodal head, your uh, drainage conditions, or dynamic, the what we'll be working with, uh, you can actually even generate the dynamic loads, uh, apply some sort of a res you know, response spectrum analysis and such, and then run the analysis itself. So the, the sequence is very logical, left to right, the commands are very easy to see. And we do have a, a work tree that keeps track of everything we we're working with. The first tab being model is for the geometry in the mesh and the materials. The second tab is analyses, it's where you define your boundary conditions and your loads, as well as your stages and your case. And lastly, once we run the analysis, we'll go in the post-processor. This lock will be uh, closed, and we'll see results here. So we've done the first step, which is basically just tell the program we're, uh, we're going to work on 3D. Let me here just kind of try to fit this window a little bit. Uh, when it's an important step, I'll expand it. What we're going to do is... We're going to actually show some of the other nice features of, GT, of uh, GTSNX, which is that it can communicate where some of our other programs, like our building software. So I have a structure that I made specifically in our building software called Midas Gen that has specific commands for structural engineers, and it has all kinds of capabilities. You can consider it like your ETABS or your SAP, the competition of that, but it can do a lot more. And one of those things that it can do that others can't is that I can export this simple structure, but it could be a building in other cases or whatever co complex structure your structural engineer has. I can export it. I can send it directly to my geotech software, creating an MXT file. So let's just call it, uh, you know, session or whatever example. We just save it under some format. And it makes this kind of file. Then it's, here we're seeing it as a notepad. It's just information about where the nodes, the loads, the materials are. And the program TSMX can read this file to have the structure in place. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to directly look for that file. I'll go to the start file. I'll go to import. And I'll go to the same format, MXT. And I'll open that file. And then the program has now imported. We see here I have the properties defined of my structure. I have boundary conditions. I have loads created. So I have my you know, simple structure here, but this applies for any kind of structure, bridge as well. And so I can then, uh, you know, here it's a fixed boundary condition. What we actually are interested about is how it's going to have interaction with the ground. So we don't want to have any superficial boundary condition. The loads are fine. And we can see we even import some advanced features uh, like uh, beam and release conditions and such for our structure. So this is a metallic, the metallic structure that will support part of our tunnel. And we want to get structural results like moments and such from the analysis. The next step we're going to do, I think there's a little more fitting. OK. Uh, the next step we're going to do is we're going to define our materials for the ground itself. The structure materials have already been imported, but we also need to define the, the concrete wall and such. So first we define materials using the Hope Brown, and then we tell the program how these properties are going to be applied. We're going to tell it 3D, 2D, shell, such. So let's go through that. I'm going to go back to the table just so I can have the information for me to read. And I'll show you how to set up one, uh, just to give you a general idea. So we go to the Mesh tab. First, The very first command is Material. We see here that I have Concrete already imported from my structural program. So here I would go to Create. I'm going to be working with Isotropic. We can also do some other kinds of Orthotropic for uh, Joint Rock Mass and such. And from here, what I do actually, first thing I do is I select from the list the constitutive model that I want to use. So we see here we have Hope Brown and Generalized Hope Brown. We have some other ones for Camp Clay, like uh, for consolidation or soft soil creep, UVC sand for liquefaction and such. So we have a very extensive list that we're constantly uh, updating. We select the Generalized Hope Brown. And let's, uh, I'm going to slide this a little bit over. Let's just do the, the very first one, Weathered Rock. 
Uh, here I'm working, uh, as we can see, our units of kips and feet. However, uh, my materials here are defined for kilograms meters. So I'm just going to, from this drop down menu here, I can directly just change the units. Basically, the program has imported the units as well that it's, the structure was created on. So I can now go to material, create isotropic, generalize soap brown, weather rock. Uh, let's give it a 50,000 for the modulus elasticity. That's fine. Uh, this unit weight is fine. Change. Here's the other tab. We give information about like porosity. We're doing a seepage analysis. Uh, we can give it different values, like let's say 21 or something. And then the last tab, uh, which is this information over here, is related to the nonlinear behavior. So we would basically tell it uh, this is going to be a value of 5 for the intact rock parameter, 26 for the GSI, and the distributed factor of 0. And then the compression, unit actual compression strength, we can give it like a 5,000 and a 0 on 40 line state angle. And we would just go to OK. And we would follow the same sequence for the rest of these materials, the concrete, and the other rock layers. Once we've done that, in order to save a little time, I'm going to like uh, just import the other material so we don't have to like show everyone. We then go to the properties and we tell the program how these are going to be used. So we see here that our structural aspect uh, has steel material, but it has some sections defined as beams. And this very specific sections have like geometries related to them. So we have to do the same. Basically, we just have to tell the program, you know, I'm going to be using this new material that we created with a rock. I said 3D, so that when I mesh, I can select it from the menu. And so that's the sequence we would do for all the other materials. So now what I'm going to do is I can actually also import from an existing model. So if you work with some kind of material repeatedly, you can actually just have that material or that model as a base. And you can constantly import some of these. You can select which ones you like, for instance, here. These are the ones that are missing. So I want to import those back into my new model. And we can see that, for instance, the concrete is a shell element, and I give it the thickness of the wall and such. So now I have my materials ready. And I can get into some of the other aspects of this, which would be uh, generating the, the first step we're going to do is generate the topography, the terrain. So if I have a DXF file with contour lines, I can use a feature that we have in order to create a surface out of it. So I go here to import TXF file 3D. And let's just uh, give you uh, an idea. Let's say I have this DXF file with contour lines. We see here that these are just lines. Uh, it, it would be not useful for me to create a solid, or it would be impossible for me to create a solid element out of this. But it does give me information that I really care about, which is how my mountain range or whatever my particular section of the mine is looking. So in order for me to take advantage of that is I need to use a special tool that we have in GTSNX called Terrain Generator. I'm going to expand this just a little more. Here under Geometry Tab Tools, Terrain Generator. And it's going to allow me to create a surface out of that contour line. So we it opens this external window. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select the same file that we just did. And I'm just going to tell it that I, I want all those lines to be imported. So now I'll, I press inside this. Uh, we see the side view and the top view. Uh, I'm going to press inside, and it activates these commands. The one that I really care about is this one, the terrain generator itself. It's like a little hammer. And what it does is it opens a, a window that allows me to select the sections of interest. For instance, I tell it this is the starting corner, and I want it to be out to this corner. I can plot a zone. We see a small drawing there of a rectangle of the area that's going to be captured. And then I give it uh, sampling points. Basically, I'm telling it like the more sampling points I give it, the more realistic there's a range, uh, the more accurate it's going to be based on that info. And of course, I have to select them. Now it's confirming to me there's 188 selected. And then when I do that, I see here now that I have my 
surface created over the original contours. So then now this is information that I can use. I'm going to go here and send it. I'm going to save it as a format that can be sent back to the to the GTSNX. So I have to go here to export the surface. And then once I'm done with that, I can directly import it now to my program. So I would go to the same command, but then there's another option there called import this file. And now here in tools, terrain generator, import TMS. I select the TMS surface. And I will essentially have a surface of my topography that I can then use to create a solid. What I'm going to end up doing is similar to AutoCAD. I'm going to use a command extrude of the surface and extrude it down to make a block. The surface is something that I care about. The rest, I'll be creating my strata layers that I eventually use to divide the solid. So we see here now that different, differently than just having a, a DXF file with contour lines, I now have a surface with all those details. And I can do all kinds of analysis from this point. So now I'm going to use extrude command, like an AutoCAD. I select the direction, which is on the C axis. And the C axis positives up. In this case, I want it to be reversed down, or I can give it a negative value. We have this feature called uh, preview that allows us to see how it's going to come out once we're done. Now, given that this is a very complex uh, surface, it's going to take a second to generate the solid. But it gives you this kind of preview. Uh, it shows you the direction. It shows you more or less the dimensions. And so that's important to have a better idea of how big this model is going to be. So that's fine with me. So I just go ahead and let it create it. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use this other feature called bedding plane that allows us to use borehole information. from diff We tell it where the borehole is located. And depending on how many stratas you have, you tell it the depth of each of these planes. And the more boreholes information you have, the more spread out you have, uh, the program will extrapolate and create these planes out of that information. And then we can just use this to divide our block. So there we have our solid. I can uh, deactivate the surface just to make it a little more clean. There we go. So that can be like our starting point. And now we're going to use this other feature here called bedding plane. As I mentioned, I could uh, directly tell the program, OK, I have x amount of layers. Uh, layer one is located, you know, I could have the coordinates or I can directly draw points on my surface and kind of select them and then tell it information about the depth. Or I can directly, if I have it in the right format in Excel, as we have here, I tell it uh, I have X amount of boring holes. They're each located at, you know, this coordinate system and they have X amount of planes. Each plane has this depth at that point, that depth at that point, blah, blah, blah. I can save time to from manually doing this by just directly importing this Excel file. And so once I do that, we see here now that I have my tabs down here. Each of these tabs is a different borehole. It tells me the location, and it tells me the depth of each layer. And then I have this option here to kind of give it a little dimension as far as the program is going to do based on the boring holes. But if I give it information here, it's, it gives me an a little extra wide out just to have the planes a little bigger. So if I do a preview command, as we were doing the other side, we see how these layers are going to look once created. So we can do this manually, as I mentioned. You can directly go borehole to borehole, like selecting a, a section that you like, or and then inputting the depth of each. Or you can have it ready in an Excel file and just import it. So now we have some surfaces and a solid. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the surfaces to divide our solid. We're going to chop it up so we can get our layers. So similar to any AutoCAD program, we just go here to divide solid. We The target is our ground, and the tools are the surfaces we're going to use. So I select all four. They turn green once selected, and the program counts for me. And I just go ahead and tell it to divide. Now, again, uh, depending on the you know, number of divisions, the complexity of your geometry, 
this command can take a little uh, time, uh, only a few seconds, but just to show some of the features that GTS has specific for geotech engineers, once I'm done with this step, I basically have a starting model or the geometry of a starting model that I didn't have to draw manually. I use tools with real field data in order for me to have a starting starting model as realistic as, as it can get. In reality, I've only been doing uh, this particular part for a couple minutes. So I delete the bottom part that I don't need. Now I have a starting file that's very accurate in regards to what the terrain looks like without having to spend too much time uh, drawing it out or inputting coordinates and such. So here we have our four layers as well as the surface in place. And so what we're going to do now is uh, we're actually going to make this a little smaller. Uh, in this case, I just did it because the running time um, when I was making it was getting uh, I guess for the purposes of the webinar, a little more realistic. So I'm going to divide this up. I'm going to make a cube out of it. But all we really need, I mean, we could work on this as it is, uh, just in order to reduce the number of elements that we have. So I'm going to draw a rectangle that I will use to divide my uh, remaining sections. We see here we have this grid. This grid is actually a work plane. It allows me to not get lost in a 3D space if I'm drawing something because depth is difficult to perceive, especially when your background is all white. So if I have this grid, I directly already know when I'm drawing where it's going to be. I can change uh, my view, and I'm going to draw a rectangle bigger than my solid. But this grid allows me to have that base easy to uh, find where I'm going to end up. And we can move this grid around to serve our purpose, as we will show later. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make copies of this make two copies so that I can then use it to divide the rest of my solids. So I'll go to first translate. I select the surface. I select the axes. And I can tell it that it's going to be a non-uniform copy. I'm going to tell it the first one is going to be at 100 meters. And I want you to do another one at 350, I believe. Uh, yes, at 350. And I can also use the preview command. OK, that seems like reasonable to me where they're going to end up. So I go ahead and do that. And now I'm going to divide my solids again by these surfaces. So solid, divide. I select the four layers. So here I can see I'm missing one. Uh, I think I'm missing the first one. Yes. I have my four layers selected. I have my two tools, surfaces to divide. And I just go ahead and divide it. So here I'm just showing the images, but we actually do have kind of like the procedure laid out on the left. So when you do it on your own, you'll have a, you'll be able to read off of it. And so when we, once we've done that, we can uh, delete or we can just ignore them. I mean, we could hide them, but we can just delete the layers that we don't need. I can directly select them and just press delete on my keyboard. So now we have uh, a much cleaner starting file. my terrain with the layers and everything. So now what we could get started is to do some cuts for where our structure is going to be. And by doing that, I'm going to basically make a 3D box and then cut it. I'll go here, geometry, box. And I have these uh, coordinates. I could draw it. I can drop it directly on the, on the geometry itself. But again, talking about 3D space can get tricky. And so it's easier if I just give it like a, a point as reference, and then I just give it the dimensions. And I can do preview. That's where I want it to be. I go apply. And then I'm going to cut it. But uh, first, I'll just actually input another one where the blast is going to be. It's going to be in a different point. 25, 375, negative 10. So this would just be kind of like coordinates around your field. That's where the other one's going to be. We see it's much smaller. So now I have my two blocks in the solid. And I can now go to Boolean solid. I can cut these blocks out. 
some of the commands we have. The target is the ground. The tools are the two blocks. And we can then just cut it. And then once this has been cut, what we're going to do is we're going to move our structure, metallic structure that we previously imported, into place, into the position where the excavation is being simulated. We're going to do that by translate. So not only can we translate geometries, our structures over here, we can also translate meshed elements. So I can go to mesh and use similar commands that we've been doing for our geometry. So I go to translate. I select this, the set. It's my structure. And I can use something called a two-point vector. Basically, I can just directly tell it I'm interested in this specific corner of my structure being located at this specific point. So starting point, final point, I tell it to calculate for me. I can even do a preview, and that's exactly where I want it. So now I have the structure in place. So with very easy commands, we can start to really get a, a realistic model take shape. So now what I'm going to do is uh, I want the structure to be connected to the ground. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this command called imprint on the base elements and the basically columns of my structure. I'm going to tell, first I'm going to tell it that uh, I want to draw a 3D point. Just basically make it easier in the program. Tell it like there's a point here, 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 and here that I'm interested in being noted. I might have drawn an extra one, but that's not important. And then I'm going to tell it I want you to imprint Basically, select the surface and tell it there's these points that I care about. There should be four of them. I select direction of the shortest path. And so now I'm letting the program know when it comes to meshing, there's elements there, there's nodes there that are important to me that I want you to connect to the mesh of the ground. So I do an imprint command. And then from there, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to excavate a very tiny section of the tunnel. Uh, I'm going to draw a surface and then extrude it. In order for me to draw it properly, what I need to do is I need to move my work plane. I remember that this is kind of like to the side. So I can go within these commands. It's for the work plane. I can change the size of it, but I can also move it. Uh, I can give it a reference plane and such, but I can also use this nice feature called three points. I can give it the original point where I want it to be the center at and another point on the same plane. And then lastly, a point kind of giving it the up direction. And if I do that, we see now that my grid is now on the same plane as that wall. And so when I draw another surface there, I can make it a face. It's directly where I want it to be. And as I'm drawing, it's now on the plane that I need it. So I have that face created. I can now deactivate my work plane. And I'm going to extrude a block of a uh, of that surface into the into the wall of the rock. I'm going to change my units to feet because the structure I imported are in feet and I want it to match the, the structure. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to uh, then go to the command extrude. And I'm going to try to select the surface. Well, here it's, you know, there's another solid in place. So I can just kind of deactivate it to hide it and leave that easy surface there. So I select that face that I just created. If I scroll out a little bit, uh, I have a general idea of which direction I want it to be. What I could do is I, I can directly select it from the work plane as well. Uh, sorry, from the work tree as well. I can tell that it's in the X direction. Sorry, in the Y direction. Uh, and I can give it a distance of 10 feet. Now here's where it's important to do preview. Sorry. So it is the x direction. Let's look at the, there's a global coordinate system over here that's letting you know. Ah, and I select the face again. Sorry, it's getting a little messy. Okay, I'm gonna zoom out just to make it more clear on what we're doing. Um, I'll select the face, I'll select the direction. And I'll give it the value. And now when I do the preview, I can see in which direction it is. It's coming in. So I'm going to do a reverse direction. Now I have the block in the right direction. And I can just create it. 
And then what I'm going to do is uh, I want to add some supporting structures because this is eventually going to be excavated out. There'll be some shock creep. But I want some metallic structure to be also supporting the shock creep. So what I can do is I can actually copy elements that are already in place down over the surface. So I can do this translate command. Uh, I can select particular elements. Let's select the beams and columns that are at the end, these five. I can select the direction. Again, I can uh, kind of scroll out and to make it easy to see some X direction. I give it, I tell it I want to make a copy, and then I tell it the distance, and then I can do preview. Again, I need a negative value there. As I'm seeing now, it's going to come this way. So now the support structure will be in place. And we see that we have some uh, metallic component to it as well as the, well, we need to extract the shock ring. But for now, we have the metallic support as well. So now we can uh, go into meshing. We have a, uh, oh, one more command. We need to cut that uh, block out of the solid. So let's uh, leave these two on. I'll go to geometry, solid cut. The target is the main ground and the tool will be that block. I'm actually gonna tell it that I don't wanna delete it after it's done cutting. I'm gonna need it for later. So I can undo that, and that way it'll cut it, but I'll still retain the original section of the tunnel. And I'll show you later why that's handy in this, for this kind of thing, where you want to have a reinforcement apply, like a shock creep. So now we have the, if we activate the solids here, uh, we have if we kind of scroll in, we have now the excavation as well as the support structure. So we can now jump into right into the meshing. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to mesh layer by layer. I'm going to kind of zoom out. I'll go here to mesh, 3D, generate 3D. I'll give it a specific size. I'm going to switch back to meters. I'm going to tell it, uh, let's say, 15. It's the distance to space between. I can do a preview command, and it'll show me the distribution of the nodes uh, around my surface. We can select either a tetrahedral measure or a hybrid, which is a combination of the hexahedral and tetrahedral. And then I would assign the property, which is the bedrock. Uh, and this particular surface, it's a little complex, given the structure in place. So right now, when I'm doing the preview command, it's not generating the mesh yet. It's getting an idea. Uh, I wanted to see the size distribution. It's letting me see where they're going to be. So this this might take a little second, as we can see. We'll end up with some sort of complex geometry um, in place with the topography. But the idea is that you get these previews of the nodes of how the size distribution is going to be. And if you want to change your mind, you have an idea before you generated the mesh, and you have to undo it and redo it again. But what we really care about is these nodes lining up. You can see here at the uh, at the all important excavation site, uh, these nodes have, have to like match up with uh, what we're doing. So we see there how that's going to look. I assign the right property, which is the weathered rock, and I give it a name. And this might take uh, just a second. But we see the progress of the meshing. And we can do parallel meshing. If we have several geometries that are the same size. So as this is meshing, the next step we will be doing is we're actually going to mesh that block that we used to excavate the tunnel with the same property. And then from that, that mesh excavation, we can extract from the, from the geometry, from the face of the geometry, the shock creep, the concrete. I can create a 2D mesh out of that geometry, but it's a much easier for me to do it out of this block than to try to select the interfaces of the tunnel. So that's this is why it's handy to have the the original geometry still left. And so once you generate both of these meshes, you extract the shock creek, uh, you have your structures in place, then it'd be really easier for us just to, to finish this model. We just mesh the rest of the ground layers that are don't have the complex uh, surfaces as our, our topography. 
and they won't take us long to mesh. So we have the surface meshed. We see here the nodes directly line up with the structure since we did an imprint command. Uh, I'm now going to mesh this inner block the same size. We'll call it the escatunnel, what will be excavated, just so it's easy to keep track of. And then I'm going to activate the geometry and deactivate my mesh sets for now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this extract command over here in the mesh element. And I can select from a face. And I'll select the three faces of the block that allows me to basically generate a shock creep tunnel. So I can tell it this is like the tunnel lining. And it has the 2D property of the concrete. So once I have that, we see there now I have that structural component as well. And I can go on to meshing the rest of my geometries, the rest of my layers. So I'll just go in sequence. Um, this one can be something like 20. And it has the property of the weak rock. And it's much, much faster to mesh now that uh, we don't have any complex topography. This is strong rock. Let's do it a little bigger. And lastly, we have the bedrock. OK, so now when I turn everything on, everything is meshed. And what we can get into now are the boundary conditions. So we need to run a time history analysis. Uh, and in order for do that with the proper damping, we're going to need uh, some, uh, some periods of the modes of vibration. So I'm going to go here first to element, create. And I'm going to create ground surface springs. I'll select the four layers. And I'll tell it that I want a fixed bottom, basically uh, simulating the bedrock being fixed. The only value I have to give it is the modulus of elasticity coefficient, which is explained uh, here in this equation. And the program will automatically calculate the modulus of subgrid reaction based on the other information that we have here, like the surface, the size of the face, as well as some of the properties of the, of the ground itself. So it's not too complicated. We just go ahead and apply that. We have that in place. And now we can directly now run an eigenvalue analysis very quickly. I can go to analysis, general. From here, I have the options of what kind of analysis I want to do. I'm going to select eigenvalue. And I want to activate everything except for the excavated tunnel. And I tell it in analysis control how many modes I care about. Let's say just like 30 or something. And like we perform it, we run it. And once we run that, uh, I have to say that, okay, example, recession. It'll start running. So once we do that, uh, we'll get a table of uh, periods and modes. What we care about is the first and the last vibrating mode. So what I'm going to do when I get that table is I would write down those periods that I have to then input into my time history analysis uh, damping. So here it's finished running. It took eight seconds. I go to results. We see, as I mentioned, that now that this tab has information and the lock is closed. So I have the modes of vibration from all of them. I'll click on this very first one that's to open the table instead of going individually one by one. And I'll write down this period and this period. Uh, let's just say that I wrote it down on my desk. But that would be the procedure. So I have those two periods in place. I'll be using them for my damping. And now I go back to the pre-mode so that I can edit my model. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the damping boundary conditions. It's a little different than what we were just using. They're not ground surface springs. They're actual dampers. So I'll go again to mesh, create, other. I select the same option, uh, ground surface spring, but now I go down here to damping and I deactivate the fixed boundary, uh, the fixed bottom. I don't need that for the blast. And I select the four layers and I call these dampers. And similar to the previous procedure, the program will automatically make these. Uh, these are the different equations now that it's using 
the shear modulus, the elasticity, based on the properties of the ground again, and it will calculate the dampering constant for me. So now we can directly go into creating the information about the blast. Uh, I would go to the dynamic type analysis. Uh, it creates this, opens this window. I go to, I can either generate the training dynamic load or blast dynamic load. And this is information that I'm gonna just basically copy directly from here. I'm gonna move it a little bit just so it's easier to see. Okay. Uh, train. Nope. Blast. Okay. So we give it these values. That in this case I have this information, but you would have this from uh, your explosives engineer or somebody in your lab or something. I'm running a little bit low on time. I apologize. I'm going to try to get through this as fast as I can. We're almost done. We just apply the load and set up the analysis, and I'll open the finished model so we don't have to wait for it to run through. We should be fine. And then we give it the value for how long uh, the blast is going to last and the in time increment. So we have four zeros and then a five. And we click OK. We generate a, a, a graph that I can then uh, save it in a format like uh, .dgs that the program can then read. So I save that file. I could also just have uh, a table that I directly copy paste from Excel. It doesn't have to be that same, uh, you necessarily don't have to use this function. If you have your own blast information, you can directly just do it uh, copy paste. Then I'm going to tell the program that I want to use a function, define a function. And this is going to be a time force function. Time down here, time forcing function. I want to add it. And I can directly import, or as I mentioned, copy paste this, uh, this blast. So we have here the increments are what I had defined. And then the value here, I'm going to tell it it's a normal. And then I tell it OK. So now I have it created. And now the last thing I need to do is I need to apply it. So I'm going to do a dynamic surface load and select the interfaces of my boring hole over or my hole over here, which can get a little tricky with the rotation. So let's just tell it here it's a dynamic surface load. It's a face pressure, 3D face. I can rotate it if I hold down to the scroll button on my mouse. So I select the 10 faces. I give this, this becomes a multiplier because it's not a static load. And then I select here the function. And now I can kind of see some visual arrows representing that it's been made. And so the last thing I need to do now is create the 10 history analysis. So I would go back to analysis, generate, and I go to time history. Let's select the direct method. There's two methods. Here we tell everything we have and what we want to consider. So we want to consider the dynamic load. We don't want the ground surface springs. We want the dampers. And then we also don't want the excavated tunnel. And we want everything else, though. So we have the structure as well as the shock creek, the tunnel lining in place. right? So the next thing we need to do is tell it the time steps. We tell it here. This is going to match what we had for the at least the time increment. We'll say I need to change to seconds. So I'll close this for now. Uh, let's, uh, OK, I'll give it a quick, just so I can close it and come back to it. Let's just add it for now, and I'll come back and edit it. Uh, I need to change this to seconds down here before I can properly define it. And I can go here on the works tree and directly just right click in. Uh, we have kind of like the history of everything we've made, as well as like the analysis cases. So I can just tell it, edit. I need to uh, change this, define it. And so this will be the same one I can select it. I can just tell it it's going to last three seconds. Uh, the increment is going to be the same as I defined the blast. Uh, there's four zeros and a five. And this last one is um, how every how often I want a value to be uh, added to the output file. The more, uh, if I do a one, 
like basically every single value, my output file is going to be really big, like heavy. If I give it, you know, this is going to have many, many steps. So every 50 or every 20 is fine. So it's going to still have like 60,000 steps. And then the last thing I need to do is I need to define the, the damping analysis control. Some other features you can uh, specify, like the self weight, apply K and not condition and such, the damping method. We'll do calculate by period, and I'll write down the previous periods of, um, you know, you got from your eigenvalue analysis. In this case, let's just stick with uh, the information that I have right there. So the first period was two five six nine five, and I give it a five percent damping. And then the other one is one point three zero seven nine. Let me give it a five percent damping. Okay, and we'll be ready. We can just directly tell the program, okay, let's uh, go ahead and run the analysis. I go to perform again, and I just run it. And for the essence of saving time, let's just open a file that's already open or finished. Uh, I'll bring this one up over here. So it's a finished file. We're in the post mode, and if I go to results, uh, we have here the time history analysis, so I can then expand any one of these time steps and we look at the kind of results that are displayed. So we have the general ones for like the, the ground display or the overall displacements, but we also have them specific for, for instance, like your beam elements or your shell elements. The shell element being, if you remember, the concrete, the beam elements being the structure. So we can kind of take a closer look and let's say uh, go to the displacements. Let's do like a a time step animation of everything that's going to happen. So I want to see, let's say, the overall displacements, the total trans translations. Because I can also specify by direction. So here it's uh, loading the result. So we see here that very instant where there's the actual explosion. Um, I have a deformation that's uh, a little exaggerated but I can actually also do actual deformation. And then I have a little bar down here that once I click on it with my keyboard, I can control the step. So here we're seeing uh, the expansion of the wave. I'm gonna go switch now to actual deformation so it's more realistic. And I can see how it's propagating uh, as it's getting close to my structure. Now, if there's particular points of interest, uh, I can switch to millimeters. Let's say I don't want my structure to move past the maximum value. I can actually probe it. I can directly select like two or three points around my uh, structure just to kind of get a better idea. This being visually, but I can also do that as the wave is coming close. I can also extract that to a table over time. So we see here we start to see some like fractions of a millimeter and such on the structure itself as far as displacements as the wave is coming in. But it doesn't seem to really get uh, too out of hand. So we can kind of navigate that uh, whole explosion through this bar tab down here. We can also see directly uh, at different points would be other results of interest, like uh, let's say further down, I want to see the moments on my structure. I can directly expand the type of result that I need, which are moments. I'm going to give it a double click. And now the program has isolated for me these moments uh, at that particular instance, but I can also navigate through the blast process, see if anything is getting, I would switch back to kilotons per meter and see if anything's getting out of hand. And similarly, I can also do, uh, well, axial forces, shear forces, but for my reinforcement, Uh, for the shell element of the tunnel, I could also directly measure forces on that. And so through this process, you can have a better idea of how thick the reinforcement needs to be. Based on uh, what kind of forces you're getting on your wall and moments you're getting on your wall. And lastly, I'll show you how we can uh, get a graph out of this. I can directly go to extract results. I select the kind of analysis, which is time history. Let's say I care about the 
maximum or the actual forces at two different points of my structure, let's say at this column and at this beam or whatever, and I can directly just generate a table for all the steps. And then I can directly select it and either send it to Excel or, or graph it. And I can do this for any kind of results. And I can see uh, it's probably the beam that's really vibrating. Uh, actually, it's the column that's really vibrating. The beam seems to be kind of more dampened. So we can get these kind of graph results as well. So that's the uh, end of my presentation. I'm actually exactly on time. Uh, I will leave it open for a minute or two if you have any questions, or you can just directly mail it to me. For those of you who want to get a copy of this, you can type it into the question box, and I'll be glad to send you the video or the, P the PPT and the models. But thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'll leave the session open for some questions now.